really interesting talk, a little bit about Node and Socket.io. Um, uh, so yeah, we're going to be talking a bit about JavaScript today. And um, Graham asked the question, but I was kind of sitting there, I didn't look back. So who's actually worked with JavaScript in this room? You just put up your hand. Oh, so quite a few of you have, but I think a more important question is, who likes JavaScript? Well, okay, not quite as many hands, but we're kind of getting there. Um, look, you know, JavaScript, it's, it's, it's not a bad little language, it's a very special language, I think would be the best way to put it. Um, but it's interesting at the moment because I think that there's quite a lot of interesting stuff happening in the JavaScript space. Graham just dem demonstrated some interesting 3D stuff. Uh, but there's a lot going on at the moment that I think makes it a language that's worthy of reconsideration. Okay? So in this talk I'm going to uh, cover, you know, why that's the case, you know, why you should really care about JavaScript if you haven't paid much attention to it so far. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this renaissance, which I think is manifesting itself at the moment in the form of some quite interesting open source projects that are out there. I think uh, I'm going to cover three of them. The first one is Backbone.js, which is a MVC style project for big single page applications. The second one is Node, uh, which Graham covered a little bit, and you probably heard a little bit about. I'll, I'll be talking about Node and giving maybe just an introduction to some of the core concepts behind Node. And then finally, I'm going to talk about CoffeeScript, which is sort of the, uh, the language that you use if you want to write JavaScript, but you don't really want to write JavaScript. So um, we've talked a little bit about you. You've done a little bit of JavaScript stuff. I saw a few hands there, so we'll talk a little bit about me now. I'm a Java developer primarily, probably for about 10 years, and then three years of Ruby, Ruby on Rails. I'm not a JavaScript ninja either. I'm not sure if I'd actually want to be, to be perfectly honest. Um, but I think that... Uh, all throughout my career, JavaScript has always been kind of lurking in the background. It's something I was never really able to escape, you know. I, I'm an, essentially an enterprise developer, basically. And there was always this little bit of a website that needed to be tweaked or a little bit of dynamic behavior that needed to be, um, needed to be set up. And I'd usually try and palm it off on somebody else uh, because, frankly, when it came to JavaScript, my relationship felt a little bit like this when it came to JavaScript. I didn't really understand what I was doing. It scared the hell out of me. You know, it had lots of sharp, nasty edges and sharp teeth. And um, but, but the sad fact was that it wasn't going away. I always hoped that JavaScript would go away, and it just never did. It, all, it always hung around, OK? Um, but, you know, it's still here. And so the question arises, and this is the first thing I want to talk about, is why JavaScript? Why should we worry about JavaScript? Why should we continue to uh, think about JavaScript? Let's start with a really obvious, really obvious thing, okay? So there's about, there's about a billion PCs worldwide at the moment, and I think it would be fair to say that the vast majority of those has a web browser, and I think it would also be fair to say that the vast majority of those web browsers are running some sort of JavaScript engine. So from that, you can pretty much infer that JavaScript is actually probably the most widely deployed, at least interpreted language in the world at the moment, like it or not. Now, some of you may be familiar also with the, uh, the Tiobe Language Index. You know, it's sort of, they release it every year. It's kind of, you know, what's the most popular languages at the moment. For the last 10 years, JavaScript has only ever really oscillated between 8th and 10th position. It's always been in the top 10 other of the scripting languages. Of the other scripting languages, some have come and gone, some have become more popular and then slipped out again, but JavaScript's always been there, which I think kind of is indicative of the, the, you know, the general vibe of JavaScript. It's just not really going away, basically. So I think that we are going to have to, like it or not, accept that JavaScript's here to stay and it's going to be hanging around for a while. And I think that um, you know, all this is good about JavaScript being widely deployed, but there's an even more important an important fact about JavaScript, and I think that the Googles and the Apples and the Twitters and the Facebooks, they all know this, and that is that users are going to demand increasingly interactive applications, basically. They don't want uh, request response cycles. You know, they don't want to have to sit there whilst their browser refreshes and the, you know, the little icon spins. They want to see things straight away, and the big guys know this. Okay, uh, I think Twitter is probably the, the biggest example at the moment. We have this rise of what's called the single page application. This is a web application where pretty much the whole thing is downloaded to the browser in one hit and really one, runs in one browser page. Okay, There's no page refreshes anymore. If you look at Twitter's, at the source code underlying Twitter's site, it's just a bunch of empty divs. The rest of it's all just downloaded and rendered. Okay, the other guys know this to varying degrees as well. You know, Gmail—it's a pretty—it's a pretty dynamic app. There's no refreshes there. Even Facebook—they appear to have different URLs, but if you look pretty closely at the behaviour, there's a lot of crazy dynamic stuff going on under the hood. And Apple have embraced this, although you mightn't realise it, with the iCloud and Mobile Me, with frameworks like Sprout Core and stuff like that. Really rich internet applications, basically, and all done with JavaScript. Now, I think that the other big, uh, big uh, driver behind it all is. You know, 
HTML5, basically. So that, rightly or wrongly, um, is introducing things like the Canvas and local storage and so on. So, look, I have used and liked Flash and Flex in the past, but I think they're pretty much knackered now. Okay, I think that it is going to be a little bit of a backward step to HTML5 before things move forward again, but I think now is pretty much the time that um, uh, we can rely on browsers to do these sorts of things for us. Okay, and I think also I didn't mention I mentioned a billion PCs before, but that's even before we talk about mobile devices, which have also changed the game in, in a lot of ways as well. And I think actually mobile devices are driving. Um, a lot of the, uh, the, the take up of single page applications that are really only done with JavaScript and, and HTML5. Because frankly, you know, um, Steve Jobs basically threw down to Adobe regarding Flash and they didn't really respond for quite a long time. And any response that they have given so far has essentially been on the lines of, yeah, we're going to move away from Flash and Flex. We're going to start to embrace HTML5 as well. So, JavaScript's been around for quite a long time and it's got a pretty bad reputation. Um, I think to be fair, you know, JavaScript's kind of Pretty funky little functional language under the hood. Um, it's just got some really ragged kind of edges to it. Um, but also, to be fair, I think that a lot of people's problems with JavaScript essentially boils down to problems with the browser document object model. Okay, there's been inconsistencies between browsers for a long, long time, and they're getting better essentially. Um, but people kind of confuse uh, inconsistencies and bugs and incompatibilities in the DOM with browser script sucking in general. And I think it's important to keep them separate. Nevertheless, there has been a problem, and to, to um, work around it, we've had frameworks like jQuery come to the fore that seek to abstract all that stuff away and provide a consistent interface for, for dealing with a DOM. And jQuery's been, been great. You know, there have been other contenders, but I think that it would be fair to say that at the moment, jQuery's probably pretty much um, become preeminent as the, you know, the dominant JavaScript framework. It's got you know, great widget set, great uh, plugin framework. It's, it's really got mind, mind share at the moment. However, my essential contention would be that for the sorts of uh, apps that we're going to be seeing more and more of in the future and we're seeing at the moment jQuery in itself is not enough essentially okay it's just it's a it's a great framework for beginning to string things together but for building the sorts of rich apps that, that our users are going to want with the sort of interactivity that they want I would say that jQuery is not enough which brings me pretty much to my first framework that I'm going to cover and that is backbone js so has anyone here heard of backbone js has anyone used backbone js okay all right couple <laughs> um, I think the thing to remember is that you know we have a pattern for building uh, large uh, user interfaces. Essentially, it's been around for a long time. Can anyone tell me what that pattern is? MVC. MVC. Yeah. So there's nothing new about MVC. In fact, there's not. There's quite a few MVC frameworks out there for JavaScript. You know, there's things like Knockout, uh, JavaScript MVC. I mentioned Sprout Core earlier. Sprout Core earlier, which is getting towards the the, the fatter end of the frameworks. Spectrum that provides a big widget set as well, and then you even have stuff like Cappuccino, which is like this mad port of like the whole, uh, you know, uh, OS X Cocoa to JavaScript, complete with Objective C being imported to Objective J. So we don't want to go down that sort of mad path, but um, we want to keep perhaps on the lighter side of things, and that's why I picked Backbone JS to talk about because it is very lightweight, it is quite UI agnostic. People. Um, don't necessarily want um, desktop apps in the browser, and I think especially in the mo with things moving to mobile UIs, that's become especially the case. People expect websites to have a nice, unique look and feel. They, you know, there's going to be website designers involved, so we still do want to be able to essentially, you know, a bit of HTML and nice things being served up with CSS. So Backbone provides a way for you to keep using that, but also put an MVC behind the hood, and I think that's, um, I think that's a really important aspect of it. And also, frankly, Backbone's just got some some momentum at the moment, in my opinion. All right, so what I'm going to do is, so you might be saying, oh, Ben, you know, what's this whole single page app thing? You know, what are you kind of talking about? Let's start with a, 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 a solid example, essentially. I'm just going to quickly pop this one up. This is a little um, single page app that I wrote. It's just a, a booking calendar, a shared booking calendar. You know, you can just put little bookings in this thing. You can kind of drag, drag in new appointments if you want and blah, 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 and edit them. And you can also resize them and so on. And I think that I'm... Um, Underneath the hood with all this, we've got a Rails application, okay, that's kind of dealing with changes to data and resizes and so on. And so it's all quite dynamic, but stuff's happening behind the hood. And what we have is um, a single page app taken to its logical conclusion where you just have a bunch of stuff that's running in one page in the browser, and the communication with the back end is just via JSON and RESTful URLs, essentially. So it's kind of ironic because we've got we're going back towards the old client server model where you've got a faddish kind of client just using a, a, a remoting protocol, essentially, to talk to a server. So there's a little demo. Let's talk about what some code might look like 
uh, that you use with Backbone.js to assemble this sort of thing. I think a code, code's a really good place to start, okay? Um, all right, so Backbone gives you models, essentially, um, and this is where you get the biggest bang for your buck with Backbone. They pretty much out of the box give you a mechanism for syncing to a back end. If you've got a back end that's accessible by RESTful URLs and JSON, Backbone will give you a pretty good way to just grab those models from the back. Essentially, it works especially well with Rails. I found it uses supports Rails style RESTful URLs quite easily, but it can be customised for other style REST URLs if you want. So in this case, we've just got the notion of a booking and a collection of bookings, and they're just sourced from a from a back end URL. That's the first concept that Backbone introduces. The next concept is what Backbone calls views. Now, this is kind of annoying because what Backbone calls a view, I kind of call, would call a controller. I think the, the key part is, though, that it intermediates between the DOM and your model slash collections. Okay? So let's have a little bit of a look at the code. We've got a note, notice here where a view essentially has an underlying collection that it is responsible for rendering, and it ask that collection for notifications of events that it generates. Because the other great thing about backbone models and collections is that they can generate events. When you add something to a backbone collection, it'll generate an event. When you change an attribute in a model, the model will generate an event. Even if you change a model in a collection, the collection can generate an event. What we're subscribing to there with the reset event is we just want to know when the collection gets repopulated. Uh, backbone also supports just, this is more, views are more of a convention than anything else in backbone. It, Supports a basic mechanism for rendering, although you do all the work yourself there. I'm using a jQuery um, calendar component. I'm just getting it to render it on the element that this in the DOM that this backbone view is is wrapping around. We've made it that when the reset event is detected on the collection, we call an add all method down here, and all that really does is tell the jQuery calendar component to render some events into itself. And also we can Conversely, ask to receive notifications from the DOM when events occur and take action appropriately. So I've just really got a handle click method. You know, just do whatever you want. So a little bit of code there. The key part is, you know, what happens when we all put it all together. So let's let's do that. And it's quite straightforward. Once you've got all of these these building blocks in place, okay, you create a bookings collection, you create a view, and as I said, it's intermediating between an element and the DOM. Here we've got the, the thing with the idea of calendar and a collection of bookings. We tell it to render, but at that point it doesn't really do much. It just jams a, a jQuery calendar component into that, that element on the page. It doesn't do much. The key part is when we call render, basically. Uh, I'm sorry, when we call fetch. When we call fetch on that collection of bookings, it goes to the back end, gets all of the bookings, populates them into the collection. It then emits a reset event. And our view is listening for that reset event. It detects the reset event. It tells the, the jQuery calendar component to, to populate itself. And that's how it all hangs together. And what I've found is that it's kind of hard to demonstrate the benefits of MVC, MVC as, at a broader scale. It's, it's a pattern that scales dramatically. It's difficult to demonstrate in an example. But this type of pattern, and this has been proven in the past, works really well for large-scale UIs. Okay? And I've used Backbone commercially before, and I've just found, yeah, it takes a, it's got a little bit of a steeper learning curve at the start, uh, but you know, it's a pretty handy framework for building complex single-page applications. Okay, so there's a little bit of code there, so and a little bit to get your head around. Probably the most complex coding presentation. I'm just going to show this picture of a fluffy bunny, just so you can just chillax a bit. And I'm just going to talk a little bit more about Backbone. There is one thing that single-page applications at least as I've shown them to you, won't <coughs> necessarily do. Something that users have come to expect. Can anyone tell me what that might be? Yes? Refresh when you get lost. Uh, re yeah, well, I guess that's one way of putting it. History. Go back a step. Yes, exactly. History, back buttons, refresh, and so on. People expect to be able to go to URLs, and they expect things to happen when they go to particular URLs. And frankly, the web application I've shown you just has one URL. That's actually that's not good enough for most users. Okay. Fortunately, there is a way with single page apps in general to deal with that. You know, the the, the frameworks, including Backbone, can, can have a look at the URL that's been entered in there and assemble their state accordingly. Okay. And there's a couple of mechanisms that you can use. There's quite modern ones, push state that HTML5 provides, or you can even fall back to just you know conventions in URLs and so on. And that's what Twitter does if you look at some of their URLs. Okay, so that's the first of our frameworks, the first of the new JavaScript frameworks that I found pretty handy. The second one is Node, of course. Now, Node, ironically enough, is probably the most well known. Again, so who's, does anyone use Node here? Right, so a few of you have. Okay. 
it's, it's a funny one because it's kind of had a lot of mind share recently, but it's also one of the most unusual frameworks in, in where it fits in with the JavaScript ecosystem. Um, I think it would be first instructive to just talk a little bit about what Node is, at least what I think Node is. Some people describe Node as being JavaScript on the server, but I think that's a little bit constraining. I think it's better more to describe it as JavaScript outside the browser. And the reason that I make that distinction is that JavaScript inside the browser is essentially operating in a sandbox, and that's what constrains it, the language as we've known it anyway. And the main constraint that it's had is, is I.O. related, so you can't really do file system stuff in the browser, your networking is pretty limited, you know, you can't really launch processes and so on. I think that, from my perspective at least, what Node really does is um, fill in some of the missing missing parts of the, the, JavaScript, of the uh, sandbox that a JavaScript interpreter runs within, and in doing so, turn it into a more fully-fledged scripting language. Okay? The interesting twist to it all is that it retains JavaScript's event-based heritage. Because JavaScript was designed for <coughs> event-based UIs. You know, any JavaScript developer who's any good is going to be familiar with um, writing their UIs in an event-based manner. Because if they don't, someone pushes a button and the whole, the whole browser window hangs. Okay? The, note is an experiment in the sense that they have said this event-based approach could apply quite well on the server or for, or for building performance servers. And the notion of event-based servers is not a new one. I mean, Nginx is probably the most well-known. Um, there have been event-based uh, frameworks in other languages like um, Event Machine in Ruby or Twisted with Python. Node is an experiment and then they've gone, JavaScript is inherently, or is a language highly geared towards event-based programming. Let's take that to the server and see what happens. Okay? I think it's also instructive to have a quick look at the Node.js architecture to get a feel for what Node is. We'll start with the bottom left, V8. So we've got Google's V8 JavaScript engine, a highly performant en engine, okay, that enables the sort of 3D apps that if you were in the previous presentation, that enables that sort of performance. Google have taken JavaScript performance really seriously. Node adds some additional things though. Essentially it, it provides bindings, usually written in C and C, C and C++, to quite low level system libraries that give you event loops and put wrappers around the, the threading that you get at the operating system level. And it even gives you a little bit of support for crypto and stuff like that. And in doing so, it provides all of this I.O. Okay, and all of these I.O. capabilities. That said, and people might realise this, Node is actually quite a low-level framework. It really just is I.O. They haven't really layered a huge amount of stuff on top of that. Okay? And I think that's a, a misconception some people might have about it. So let's take a, a quick look at an example in action, and we'll stick with the booking calendar example that we had earlier. So let's say instead of, in, instead of doing a back-end in Rails, say that we were to do at least some of the server with Node. Okay? So that we were to have a, a little server that, that served up a, a, a selection of bookings. Here's what some of the code will look like and we'll cover off uh, some of the key attributes of Node in doing so. Okay, so at the top we've got this require keyword. So another thing that Node brings to JavaScript that JavaScript doesn't have is some, some native module support basically. JavaScript doesn't, in the browser at least, doesn't really have anything along those lines. So Node has this ability to pull in libraries using require. Now, any library-based framework is only really as, use, as useful as the package ecosystem around it, and Node's got a package management system called NPM. Um, there's about 4,500 packages out there, I think, the last time I checked. And yeah, NPM has proven really successful. It's a bit like Ruby Gems or something like that. Um, so what we're bringing in here is probably the most popular Node framework, and that is Express. And Express essentially provides a whole bunch of HTTP stuff on top of Node. So if you want to use Node for um, routing and request processing or even a bit of view rendering or session support, just the sort of thing you're used to doing if you're writing um, web applications, Express will give that to you. In this example, I'm going to make it that um, the, our little server is interacting just with a SQLite database. There's lots of other database adapters out there that are available. I'm just going to stick with SQLite for now. Um, I've left out a little bit of code for the database initialization because it kind of isn't the purpose of this demo. What I want to talk, what I want to get across in this code is the, the programming model that Node uses because it is, it is a little bit different. So what we do is we set up our database, we ask to create a little server, and we say when the bookings URL is called on this application, we want this particular function to be invoked. Okay? But the key thing is this is all just a callback, essentially, that's being passed through. We immediately move on and tell the server to start listening. So this is all non-blocking I.O. Okay? So say that eventually we do go through and um, call that bookings URL. The next thing that happens is we call our database and we say we want to execute this query against the database and when a result set gets returned, we want this callback to be called. But again, we immediately move on. 
It's all non-blocking. That's really key. Um, once we finally do get a response from our database, we check you know, what's in it. If there was an error, we will write the error back. If there was an error, well, we can pretty much just serialize all the rows as JSON and send them back to the client. So I've got a little node server running here. OK, so again, node's just a little command line interpreter, essentially, so um, or an extension to JavaScript. Just... So I'll start the server here. Start it up. Start on 3001. Set bookings. And it's just serving back some JSON. Okay. And the key thing is it's all done this in an asynchronous manner. There's been no blocking I.O. And at least in theory, this is where the, the strength of node, node sits. Now, I'm an enterprise guy. I mainly build CRUD applications, so I've really just provided a little relational database example here. Um, although, in all honesty, I think the example that Graham provided earlier using Socket.io um, is perhaps a more realistic um, application where Node could be really powerful. You know, group chat, gaming, things like that. Or, you know, often in an enterprise apps at least, your bottleneck's the database. It's not so much the application server. So we found it's also useful to use Node with more NoSQL databases, CouchDB, Mongo, things like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty handy framework in that respect. And again, because it's all JavaScript, you can also have the notion that, well, you know, it's, it's JavaScript front to back, which appeals to some people. Okay, so a few things and a few misconceptions about Node. We should talk about what Node is not. Firstly, it's not as easy as synchronous programming, okay? As you probably saw, we had a bunch of callbacks there. Um, something as similar as, simple as do something five times in a row and move on. Something easy to do with synchronous programming becomes non-trivial with asynchronous programming. And it's easy to, easy to underestimate that. Second thing that Node is not is it is not a full stack web framework. It certainly is not Rails for JavaScript or anything like that. You shouldn't have that misconception. Um, there are certainly lots of packages out there that can bring in a lot of that functionality, but you're going to have to put it together yourself. The third thing about Node that you should probably know is it's really not a stable API at the moment. Okay, I mean, the company that I work for, Shine Technologies, has been using Node since about version 0.2, and, and it's at 0.6 now, and things have changed a lot. Okay, it is a bit of a moving target, so definitely worth keeping in mind. All right, so let's move on to the last um, interesting project in JavaScript that I've been involved with recently, and that is CoffeeScript, because you might say, look, Ben, Backbone's great, looks really fascinating, Node looks kind of cool too, but, you know, I just hate JavaScript. You know, it's a really crappy language. Some people really don't like it. You know, it's got good functional roots, but if you're into objects and stuff like that, the support that's built into it is kind of primitive, okay? But fortunately, there is an option now that's emerged, and that's CoffeeScript. And CoffeeScript was written by a guy called Jeremy S. Kennis, who also incidentally wrote Backbone. And it's, it's essentially designed to be, you know, an, an option to JavaScript. And it's part of a new sort of wave of languages that are coming out that compile to JavaScript, you know? Like Google have recently come out with Dart. Which I think, although it's intended to run, ultimately run on its own at the moment, can be compiled to JavaScript. There's even a port of Java's Lisp dialect, Clojure, to JavaScript, Clojure script. So there's a bit of an emerging um, uh, trend in this area. And I think that CoffeeScript is probably the forerunner in this, and it's been the one that, that's, that's been there from the beginning. Uh, CoffeeScript is compiled, but it can optionally, the integration with Node is quite good, so it can essentially be interpreted directly into Node. CoffeeScript has excellent support in Rails in particular. A couple of months ago, the quite controversial decision was made to pretty much bake CoffeeScript right into Rails for doing your JavaScript work. So it's definitely got a lot of mind share at the moment. And like any good compiler, the CoffeeScript compiler is written in CoffeeScript, just in case you were wondering. Okay. So let's talk about a few reasons why you'd want to use CoffeeScript over JavaScript. Uh, classes is probably the first one. So we'll talk a bit about scope and binding, variable scope and binding. And then there's lots of other nice, nice features about it, but especially if you're coming from a Ruby background or something like that, the fact that in CoffeeScript everything evaluates to something. And I think the best way for me to demonstrate each of these kind of properties of, of CoffeeScript is just to show you some side-by-side -side examples. And once again, we will resort back to the nice booking calendar example and some of the code that you've already seen. So let's um, start with our booking declarations and do a side-by-side -side comparison. Well, I guess the first and most obvious thing about this is that JavaScript doesn't really have the notion of classes baked in. It's coming. Uh, incidentally, someone pointed out the other day that Java, it's planned that Java will have lambdas soon, and it's planned that JavaScript will have classes. What sort of messed up industry do we live in? 
do we work in at the moment? Um, but for now, uh, essentially, you know, if you want to do classes and object orientation in JavaScript, especially um, traditional uh, classical um, class-based object, object orientation, your options in JavaScript are pretty, um, well, not limited, but you've got to start from a pretty low base and build on top of it yourself, and everyone builds in different sorts of ways. So classes in JavaScript are essentially just variables that you've, you've defined you know, using whatever um, in, in, uh, class declaration framework you want to use. CopyScript works around that by essentially saying, right, you know, it, it provides a way for declaring classes, extending things, you know, calling up to super methods and stuff like that that's not really in JavaScript. Another interesting thing about CoffeeScript that you might have noticed here is it makes a rather controversial decision to use significant white space in a, in a Python-esque sort of fashion. So these two properties here, model and URL, they are indented underneath the class and that means something. That means that they belong to the class. Okay. Another significant thing about uh, CoffeeScript is that JavaScript relies heavily on properties and that's great, but you can end up with a morass of curly brackets everywhere. Um, CoffeeScript essentially eliminates that and provides a nice clean way to declare property lists. I've got this additional example down the bottom, and you might be saying, Ben, you know, why do I care about a, a variable declaration? You know, what's, what's interesting about that from a CoffeeScript perspective? But this is one of the big points, I think this um, covers one of the big uh, bugbears with um, JavaScript, and that is variable declaration. If I don't put a var in front of that, it'll bind it to the, you know, the window scope, the, a global scope. It essentially becomes a, a global variable, and that's really, you know, we don't need to talk about the downsides of that. It's really easy in JavaScript to inadvertently declare global variables, unless you go out of your way to ensure that you don't. CopyScript essentially turns that on its head and says, I'm going to make everything local by default, unless you go out of your way to make it global, which is probably pretty much the way it should be. So in CopyScript, you know, there's no vars or anything like that. You just call it, and it does its thing, and it keeps a nice manageable state on your scope. And you know it also lets you leave out parentheses if you're if you're that way inclined. <laughs> as a as a Rubyist I am. Uh, here's another example of some JavaScript versus some CopyScript. Uh, a couple of interesting things about this function declaration. As I have said a couple of times, JavaScript, great little functional language, uh, but you know writing function all the time can be can be a bit of a pain. So JavaScript uh, CopyScript provides an easy abbreviated way to declare functions. Uh, another interesting thing about uh, JavaScript is that because of its limited object orientation capabilities, you have to pretty much call this dot on everything. So if you if you want to access something in the in the current object, you have to call this dot. CopyScript just uses a simple at notation to to access things instead of having to type this dot all the time. On the topic of this dot, question. What's the difference between the single uh, arrow at the top and the double bar? I'm just and about to get to that. Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, on the topic of this in JavaScript, um, you know, at least when I first became, first started working with JavaScript, this was perhaps the biggest, the notion of this was the biggest cause of confusion for me. I think this is actually a bad name. I think context might be a better name, because what it really is, is it's not the current object, it's just the current context that that function is being executed in. And if that context doesn't happen to have been bound to the object that, that surrounds it, it could be something completely different. And that's usually manifested in things like callbacks from UIs or callbacks from networking, where this is actually something completely different. It's not the current object. So you'll see on the left there that if I don't do that little bind at the top, the underscore bind, if I don't explicitly bind each of those functions to, to this object, those, those functions won't execute because this will be something completely different when, when they get called. Okay? It's pretty easy to admit. So we have this fat arrow notation that CopyScript introduces. If you declare a function with a fat arrow, it's immediately bound an enclosing object, and there's no worries about uh, this not being what you expect it to be. Okay, and in doing so, again, you eliminate pretty much a whole class of bugs that would otherwise be a real pain. Um, and I think that's pretty much all the things I wanted to cover in there. Again, look, I'm a Rubyist, so you know, I just love no parentheses. So. Anyway, Should question. Should the render be uh, indented inside the class, or doesn't look like this? Uh, it's just the way I'm yeah, look, it could have been just a copy and paste. Yes, it should be invented inside class to be a member. Yeah, okay. just might not paste it correctly. Okay, so one final example. I talked a little bit about how, a little bit about how in CopyScript everything evaluates to something. Uh, again, as a Rubyist, I really like that. Um, if blocks evaluate to something, and we also have this notion of list comprehensions, where essentially even a for loop evaluates to something. Now, this sort of this uh, this type of functionality can be um, uh, emulated with frameworks and so on. But really, for it to for it to be really concise, you have to build it into the language. Because you know, let's face it, in in many 
languages with at least some sort of functional heritage, uh, you don't really use for loops that much. I mean, most of the time you've got collections and you're um, iterating over them using maps and so on, and providing functions and doing it in a functional manner. So um, CoffeeScript introduces this notion of list comprehensions. A for loop essentially just evaluates to something. Well, the value of the loop is really just an array of each of the iteration values produced for each iteration of that loop. So in this case, something as simple as taking an array of positive numbers and producing a negated array of those numbers uh, in JavaScript, non-trivial becomes quite trivial in CoffeeScript. Okay, and it really cuts your code down. I mean, generally, I found in, in the work that I found that my CoffeeScript code would generally be at least twenty percent smaller than the, the corresponding JavaScript code. Now, um, there are there is uh, uh, there, there are some people out there who, frankly, um, have been using JavaScript for so long that they like all of these uh, quirks that the language has. And, you know, they like not really knowing when and where they're supposed to put a semicolon in the end or something. And they like, you know, confusion about uh, scope and, and so on. So I really just have two words for them. And they Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> uh, if you don't know what Stockholm Syndrome is, I encourage you to Google it. I'll leave that as an exercise to you, the audience. So let's wrap this up, OK? Uh, then, you do. Sure. How would you debug? <laughs> so what's the first question? Um, at the moment, you you are going to have to debug generated JavaScript. Okay. However, um, at least with Chrome and Firefox, there is work to in, to include support for source mapping, um, or including source maps with your files, so that you can map you know debugging code, and um, that's in progress. And I know that CoffeeScript is pretty much at the top of the list of languages to be supported. But yes, at the moment, it's going to make it a little bit. Difficult. <laughs> what does JavaScript look like when you compile it? Look, I, look the, the first comment that people say, the CoffeeScript ag, um, advocates say when they are asked about debugging is they go, oh, the JavaScript's really nice, though. Really <laughs> nice. But, I mean, I'm not going to say it because it's quite subjective. You know, so, but you are right. It's a fundamental issue, but there is this fundamental work being done on it, essentially. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay, so let's, let's wrap all this up. So we've got a scenario where users are pretty much demanding more and more responsive applications. It's really the way that things are going. Single page apps are coming to the fore and I think that it's an inevitable trend. As a result, um, JavaScript isn't really going anywhere, like it or not. It's going to be the language that drives all of this. It's going to be the language that drives interaction on these increasingly dynamic pages. Fortunately, there's a new generation of tools that lets you, or at least take some of the pain out of using CoffeeScript. We've seen how frameworks like Backbone give you um, a nice way to implement the MVC pattern in your fat pages. We've seen, you now this is a little bit more of a kind of joker in the pack, we've seen how Node could potentially provide a way to provide the, um, uh, how can I put this, I think that the, the applications that people are, uh, are, are going to be asking for, and are, are asking for, um, connections are going to be, have to be longer lived, people are going to want to be notified about things that are happening on the server rather than have to, have to always be asking the server themselves. I think there's going to be a lot more load on servers in that respect. Potentially, the idea is that Node is going to be an ideal framework for providing those sort of services to people in a performant manner. So we've seen Node as, an, as another um, new generation JavaScript tool. And we've also seen how CoffeeScript, if you just can't stomach JavaScript at all, gives you a nice way to um, work around some of its rough edges, especially if you've come from something like Python and something like Ruby, where otherwise it feels like a real backward step. I know that JavaScript felt that way for me when I started working with it. So I guess all I'm saying is give JavaScript a chance, okay? um, because it's going to be there, like it or not. There is some code for some of these examples available on my GitHub account and uh, references to various implementations of the calendar server and so forth in CoffeeScript and JavaScript, so feel free to check it out. And has anyone got any questions? Yes? That's a question. I have an argument. Uh, um, you said that JavaScript isn't object-oriented. Um, it is actually completely object-oriented. Um, it's quite different to, say, Java and C++ uh, that uses prototype uh, object orientation, which is just a different and arguably more flexible approach to it, um, just kind of very different use to it. Yes, yes. And I, I, I agree with that 100%. I think that if you're coming from the vast majority of other languages where people are used to writing class blah, I think that's where the, the problem sets in. Yeah, and um, you inevitably end up having to build stuff on top of it what's provided to you to get to that point. And hence there's part of a movement to, to standardise those mechanisms. Any other questions? <laughs>
Okay, that's not too bad. Well, I got that through that in 37 minutes, I believe. So it looks like an early lunch for all of you. Um, I'll be hanging around for a, bit, a little bit longer. And finally, um, keeping on with the JavaScript uh, stream, my colleague Mark Russell will be talking in more detail about some real life experiences with Node and Enterprise after lunch, I believe, in this room? Yeah. In this room. Thank you very much for your time.